All right, let's uh, pray together before we go into the word. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship you, not only this morning, but this evening as well. I pray that you'll be with us as we continue through the word and through prayer later. I pray that you'll be with me, help me to speak what you want me to speak, and use me to communicate your truth from First John. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, perhaps you are familiar with the term midlife crisis. A midlife crisis is an identity crisis where a person gets to a middle age, they've reached the carefree stages of life, and they become uh, gripped with their mortality and what's coming into the future. And they're in this no man's land, someone who has this in no man's land of, I was young, I don't know what I'm doing now, what's happening in the future. Now, I say this because our passage today has a similar kind of feel to it. John, in our passage today, gives us some answers as to what our current identity is and what our future identity will be, so we're not caught in this midlife crisis spiritually. He tells us what we are now, what we will be, and then that will push us towards godliness. So, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 John with me. We are in 1 John, chapter 3, and the section is verses 1 through 3. I'm going to be focusing on verse 2, though, because I feel that encapsulates the whole thing. And, of course, we're going to read a little bit of context, so we're going to start back in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29 as well. So 28, 29, and then 1 through 3 of chapter 3 of 1 John. It says this, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And then here's our verse of interest. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So that's our section. We're going to split this uh, verse two up i'll read it again quick beloved we are god's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is so we're going to split this up into three sections first who are what we are now second who are what we're going to become and then third how it is that we're going to get to that point may god bless us all right so first What are we now? Or more specifically, what is our current identity? Well, John's pretty straightforward here. He says that we Christians are God's children. He says we are God's children now. I think it's good to kind of parse this out a little bit, understand this a little better. What does it mean to be God's child? Well, we know that the Bible is the best commentary for the Bible, so perhaps somewhere else in the scriptures has a Good section for us. Let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Let's see if he has anything for us there on what it means to be a child of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, John says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So what does it mean to be a child of God? It means two things according to what John is saying in his gospel. First, it means you are one who has received God. You have received him. Christ's uh, ministry was filled with those who rejected him. He came to them and they said, nope, you're out. But the child of God, on the other hand, is one who goes, I'm receiving you. You're coming in, I accept you, Christ. 
He was there then and now his spirit is in the world now, so we are receiving his spirit. And then on the other hand, to be a child of God means to believe in his name. Christ's ministry was also filled with those who uh, did not believe him, believe in him, and we believe him. Some people are saying, oh, you're going to be the Messiah or whatever. No, I don't believe you. But we, on the other hand, are trusting in him, believing in him. And this isn't a sort of intellectual belief either. This is a belief that is more than that. We know that from the epistle of James that demons even believe intellectually. So belief in and of itself isn't much of anything. It's a deeper belief. Christian doesn't just intellectually believe, but this is a belief that takes Christ and puts him on us. We cover ourselves with Christ. It's a belief that trusts in Christ alone for salvation. It's a belief that he alone and his work alone will save us, nothing else. Now, of course, some will stop reading in the Gospel of John there, but we also do need to understand that those things, the receiving and the believing, are not the cause of your being a child of God, the cause of your adoption into Christ's family, but he continues in verse 13, speaking of the children of God, they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we are not the cause of our spiritual birth, and that is good to remember. We are not the cause of our spiritual birth, and we know this instinctively. Every Christian knows this instinctively because when you go back to the epistle of John, we, in, we just automatically, when we read this section, we say amen when he says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. We say amen because we know that it's God who's giving us this adoption. He's adopting us. It's his love towards us. It's nothing based off of what we do. It's all on him. It's his love for us. We've lived this life of rebellion against God, and we continue to sin, and yet he draws us in. He brings us to him. We are adopted as his children. Now, what does that mean for us practically, at least in this first point? What does being a child of God mean? Well, that's why we uh, drew from the back of chapter 2, where we know John says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now, last week, Hans said that he was going to make it tough for whoever was talking this week because he was taking from verse 1 of chapter 3, I'm doing the opposite. I'm taking it back. So Hans talked about this verse last time, and he made mention that if you have a father and a son, the son is going to naturally look like the father because he is the son of the father. So because he is the son, he looks like him. The same goes for us then. It's a similar thing. If we're born of God, born again, if we're adopted by God, then we are going to naturally start acting as if we are children of God. It's the distinguishing mark, this righteousness that Christ has that we put on ourselves as we live our lives. It's a distinguishing mark from Christians and non-Christians. Now, this also means, however, that not only other Christians can see this mark, but also the world itself can see this mark. And that means that the people of the world are not going to know us, which he says here, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. We know that uh, the world looks at God and their sinful desires and they say, no, I'm rejecting you. I don't want you, God. I, I hate you, basically, is what they're saying. But then the world turns and it looks at us and we're clothed in Christ's righteousness and God's righteousness. So naturally, the world will look at us and say, nope, I hate you, I despise you. Get out of here. You're the worst, essentially. Now, we need to make sure that we are prepared for that as we continue on through our Christian lives. It's not only uh, mockery, but you never know, death, any other kinds of persecution that we're going to have. We should prepare ourselves spiritually for this reality. The world is going to see us and it's going to have this impulse desire to hate us because it hates God and it will hate us as it did our Lord. Now, you, you might be tempted to think, you know, I could just... You know, sit in, the, sit in the background. I don't need to put on these, you know, 
clothes of righteousness. Why would I want to if I'm going to end up just being the target of a bunch of persecution from the world, which is quite, quite a big, encompassing thing the world is? Well, John has some encouragement for us in that way, so it's not just that we're going to be hated by the world, but this leads us to our second point of the verse, what will we become? Let's uh, read our verse again. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So what we will be isn't here yet. We haven't seen it yet. We aren't completely understanding of it yet. But we know that when he appears, it's then that we'll be like him and then we'll understand it. He is naturally, obviously, God. It's God, more specifically, it's God the Son who is coming in the clouds to judge both the living and the dead. At the appointed time, Christ will return. And when he does, we are going to be made like him. The logical question is, how so? How are we going to be made like Christ? Well, there's two big categories that I've put this into, but first we're going to be changed physically. That's a reality. As much as we can consider the spiritual realities that are going to be happening at the end times, we can't forget that we're going to be given a new body. We're going to be transformed. Paul says very plainly in Philippians that we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Now, I'm, you know, I'm a fairly young guy, you know, 23-ish, and I'm already starting to feel the aches and pains of being in this naturally decaying body. But we will eventually be given a body that does not get old and decay in this way. It doesn't decay, it doesn't die. We, We aren't going to be in constant pain as we go on. I don't know what that's going to ultimately look like. We have examples of it in the scripture, perhaps. We know that the disciples were all terrified at one point. They all locked themselves in this room, and then all of a sudden Jesus was just bodily there. How that works, I don't know, but I would assume our bodies will be able to do similar things. But no matter how cool we think that that sounds, that we'll be able to, I've heard people say, walk through walls, as, much, as cool as that sounds, it'll be even cooler when it actually happens that we see our glorified bodies and it'll be anything better than we can imagine that our bodies will be made new. They're going to be glorious and Christ will have given them to us. Now the other way that we're transformed is a spiritual transformation. And I think this is really at the heart of what uh, John is getting at here and the epistle and what he's going for. When Christ transforms us, we will be like him, and in that, we're going to be given a new nature. We're not going to be sinful at all. I don't know if you uh, ever consider the incredible weight that sin is on your life. I mean, just, just kind of think about it. Isn't sin just the worst? Sin is terrible. It destroys relationships. It's like the, fo- the center of anxiety and stress. It grieves the spirit. I mean, I personally don't want to grieve the spirit, and I assume you don't want to either, but yet we're out here sinning like it's our job. We sin all the time. Sin is worse than Satan, really. Satan was good until sin took root in his heart, and then he fell. So sin is just awful. Sin is terrible. And yet in the future, when Christ comes and transforms us, we're going to be completely free from sin forever. There's not going to be any more sin. We're going to be free to worship Christ unashamedly there will be no bend towards sinful fleshly earthly desires it's going to be wholly focused on him sin is this terrible burden that we can't hold ourselves it's exhausting to hold up and ultimately we won't be able to but christ is going to remove that burden like a christian in pilgrim's progress he's going to take the burden off and he's going to make us like him uh an old divine says of this, or says this about our transformation. So it's a quote about what the difference is between then and now. So he says, here, sin is mortified, but there it is nullified. Here, grace is mingled with corruption. We are like God by the first fruits of the spirit, but unlike him by the remainders of sin. But in heaven, we are wholly like him. 
Here we resemble Christ, but we also resemble Adam. Yea, and often show forth more of Adam than Jesus. But there we only show forth the holiness and purity of Christ. His image shineth in us without spot and blemish. Now, that is a great uh, future hope to look forward to. That's something that we can fix our, or not fix our eyes on, but look forward to in the future. And do you, do we, are we looking forward to this hope? Are we constant, are we thinking in our minds about how in the future Christ is going to return? And he's going to free us not only from sin and death or our decaying bodies, but he's going to make us to be made like Christ. We should look forward to that with great anticipation. And then furthermore, have we considered the timing of that transformation? This could happen at any time, really. Christ could come at any moment. Are we, are we out here adequately preparing ourselves for when Christ returns? Are we dressing ourselves in the righteousness of Christ so that we resemble him when he's coming? Are we, as the bride, making ourselves look beautiful for the groom when he returns? You don't want to be unprepared when he returns. You want to be ready. Now with that idea in our mind of being transformed or making ourselves look good for the groom when he returns, we can turn to our third question, and that is, how is this going to play out? How is this going to happen? How are we going to be transformed? What is really the cause of the transformation? That's the big question. Well, what does John say is the thing or event that's going to cause us to be transformed? He says, in our verse, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So the thing that's going to transform us and is going to change us is merely when we look upon Christ's face and we just see him as he is. It's, not, it's nothing complex. It's no mixed in works. It's nothing convoluted or anything like that. It's merely just looking at Christ and you just see him for who he is and you're transformed in an instant into his likeness. That to me is absolutely baffling that that is a reality that's going to happen. We just look at him and we're completely transformed. I was reminded of when I was preparing for this and we were, we had a men's night the other night and we were outside at nighttime. I was looking up at this, at the stars like I used to do back home in North Dakota. It was a lot easier with the light pollution being not as much, but have you ever gone out into the country before and looked up into the stars and you can look and you just see like hundreds and hundreds of stars in the sky and when you're looking at it I would dare say it's a normal thing that if you really are like taking in the sky the starry sky and like the great expanse that it is like it, it should move you a little bit you know like your soul should be moved in a certain way because it's it's a powerful thing I mean the heavens are very large and filled with a lot of stars and planets now imagine you look at the stars and you're moved by how amazing they are. Now imagine you're looking at the full glory of the one who created all of those stars, who created the expanse, who created everything. Viewing the stars will move your soul. Viewing Christ will just completely give you a new everything, a new nature. He'll change you completely. Our eternal sanctification, our eternal change, our glorification is ultimately found in just seeing Christ as he is, according to John. You know what? I can't wait. I don't want to wait. I'm refusing to wait. I'm not going to wait. I want to see Christ now, and I'm going to do that. And I dare say that John says that we should do that as well. As he says in verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And then also we can look in elsewhere in scripture. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says that uh, we are beholding the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory 
to another. So it's a current thing. We're being transformed now. Uh, beloved, if you are someone that is hoping in Christ, the natural outpouring of that is that you will actively work to be purified. Your purification is directly connected with your being changed from one degree of glory to the other. So we, we know that this can only occur through Christ. Christ purifies us, changes us from one degree of glory to the other. So what I think John is telling us here is that we should be attempting to see Christ as often as we can in our lives now. And there are, there are many different ways that we can do this. I mean, even in your everyday life, if you're outside, like if you observe a tree, for instance, and you look at the tree and you think, wow, isn't it amazing that Christ died on a tree for me? And you think of all the examples of how trees point to Christ in the Bible and the tree of life and all the different things in the Bible that lead to that. You could do that, like simple things like that. But I really want to focus in on some elements of our church gathering that can help us to behold Christ as he is. I just have three things. So first, we have the members of the church. When we are in community, we're given the opportunity as Christ followers to demonstrate Christ to those around us. Ideally, the church is a picture of Christ to the world, those outside of us, but also we're a picture of Christ to each other here. The love that Christ has given to us should naturally overflow to others around us so that when people when people see the church, we can see, oh yeah, this is a group of people. Christ is here and he's moving amongst these people. He's helping these people grow closer to him and closer to each other. Then also we have the ordinances. Christ has given us uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism in order to have a visual reminder of him. He, he says, of the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. So when you approach the table to take the Lord's Supper, you are seeing Christ in it. It's the body and blood of Christ. Not literally, of course, but it is a picture of Christ to us. And then baptism is similar. When we see someone being buried in the likeness of his death and then raised to walk in the newness of life, it's a picture of Christ's work for us. So when we're baptized or we see someone else baptized or when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're coming face to face with Christ and we're beholding him more and more by means that he is instituted for us. And then, of course, we have the word, the Bible. Another divine one said, the scriptures should be read with the aim of finding Christ in them. Now, the scriptures are the primary means of seeing Christ throughout our everyday lives. We've been given this means to see Christ from God, and this is a well that can never be exhausted. It will never be tapped dry. It's filled with Christ from, you could go from Genesis to Kings to Jeremiah to the Gospels to the Epistles to the Revelation of John, and you can see Christ all throughout the scriptures from beginning to the end. Or have you not read Christ beginning with the prophet, or beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them, the disciples, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So the scriptures show you Christ. So as we read our Bibles, as we continue to get in the word, let's resolve to read them with the intention of seeing Christ in them. Now, I also must mention that if you are not looking to behold Christ, if you don't want to see him as he is, if you are then not a child of God, you haven't put on the righteousness of Christ, then you must know that you are going to see him for who he is. But while the believers get to see him as this merciful savior who's coming to save us, you will see him as judge who's coming to judge the living and the dead. He'll come in the clouds you will be terrified and disgraced as you look upon him with fear for just a short glimpse before he casts you out of his presence forever into the eternal darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You will see Christ and you will be swept away unless you repent of your sins, trust in Christ alone, holy for salvation. If you look to him as the Savior and you trust him to save you, then you can be saved. But believers, consider your gazing upon Christ 
While the heathen are going to be shamed and cast away forever, you are going to be given eternal happiness, eternal joy and bliss, never-ending communion with Jesus Christ forever. That's a glorious, wonderful thought for us that as we live for eternity, we'll continue to see Christ. And that is ultimately our identity as described by John. We are children of God living in Christ's image now. And in the future, we are going to behold the face of our master and we will be changed into his likeness forever. There's going to be no more sin, no more death, no more aches or pains. It will just be eternal life and happiness for eternity all because we're looking unto Jesus and we shall see him as he is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for allowing us to go into it and see Christ. Pray that as we'll go from here and into our prayer groups that we will be trusting in you alone for our salvation and our continued sanctification. Help us to make much of Christ and to glorify him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.